Certainly, yes. Thank you very much, Carlo. My pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. And thanks uh, so much uh, to Carlo, who is always very kind to me. Uh, yes, I started from uh, fungal infections, and now I switched to RSV in the last years. Um, these are my disclosures, and the main one, uh, just like uh, Professor Baraldi, is uh, that I belong to this uh, expert network. I'm uh, a founding member of this one, and uh, the view is to represent neonatology there because it's a network of uh, several uh, subspecialists in uh, different areas, uh, all of them uh, involved in RSV. And this is a great message behind. Uh, RSV is uh, such a big problem of... Uh, uh, public health that we need to be united, we need to combine all our competencies and skills because RSV is uh, in turn uh, uh, an issue for pulmonologists, an issue for neonatologists, an issue for allergologists, an issue for uh, uh, immunologists and so on. And I will go and I could go on and on uh, uh, mentioning uh, all of them who needed to take care about RSV based on the burden that you see once more here, millions and millions of cases and uh, several hundreds of casualties every year, especially in low middle income countries. That's the appeal that Professor Baraldi uh, mentioned, concluding his talk is extremely actual and extremely current. But I will uh, go in this uh, presentation towards uh, a more, uh, a deeper uh, view on the long-term outcomes of uh, uh, RSV infection. Professor Baraldi, who's a teacher in this area, already touched some points, but I will like to expand this point and I will use this opportunity to give you some uh, uh, expanded hints on that. The, the basic starting point uh, when we talk uh, about RSV is to, is to consider the premature uh, uh, group of uh, high-risk infants. Uh, they, as it's uh, uh, clearly known, uh, uh, represent uh, those infants uh, where the disease is usually more severe. And uh, the severity of the disease is based also on anatomical factors uh, that are shared by premature infants. You can see here a pictorial view of uh, how narrow can be the airway when uh, mucus and plug plugging occur due to a respiratory infection, especially by RSV. And if you take a look to the figures, you can see even more clearly how deep is uh, the risk of severity as soon as an infection occurs. But the point is not only to have an immediate, uh, it's a, an immediate early risk. So it's not only a risk during the disease, uh, but it's also a risk uh, later on, because uh, with these anatomical characteristics, uh, an insult may translate into long-lasting uh, consequences. Uh, again, from Professor Baraldi, this is one of the most famous uh, uh, slides in the RSV word in RSV community because it's uh, showing very nicely which are the trajectories uh, during life uh, of respiratory function. And uh, if it happens that you are a smoker, you are destined to have a possible risk of a COPD earlier than if you are not. But the same, exactly the same, ex applies if you are happening to be born prematurely. So being born prematurely is a risk to have a long-lasting uh, decrease in the respiratory performances. And on this risk, it may add also inception of early RSV. But let's try to take these two points separately. First of all, tackling the point of prematurity. Once more, prematurity is the uh, 
background scenario for respiratory function. Here you see that uh, even though premature infants uh, do not feature bronchopulmonary dysplasia, nonetheless, uh, they are likely to have at least a 7% reduction in forced uh, respiratory volume when they are 25 or uh, 20 or 25 years old. If they are, in addition, bronchodysplastic, this risk increases up to 17% almost. Well, these uh, figures clearly translate into a propension, into a risk of having uh, recurrent wheezing that it's uh, higher because uh, if uh, you have limited respiratory function, stress by inflammatory insults, stress by viral injuries may, uh, may uh, cause wheezing as a response. And as a matter of fact, the risk of being premature, premature born prematurely and wheezing when you, are, when you are in the childhood is at least 50 or even 100% more. But I was Talking, I was telling you that we need to consider these two aspects uh, as much as we can uh, separately. And I will now touch the point of RSV. And RSV is a landmark for other respiratory viruses, and the number one is rhinovirus. When we have a possible association between RSV and wheezing or asthma, we need to understand, we would need to understand the chicken or egg issue, that is, uh, it is uh, a pre-existent uh, susceptibility and uh, the baby who's uh, carrying a pre-existent susceptibility becomes a wheezer once uh, he gets in contact uh, with RSV. Or has RSV the potential to cause wheezing in all infants regardless of their pre-existing susceptibility? We still don't know a clear answer to this point. We know data that have been accumulating over the years, mainly on historical cohorts. And designing a trial, being able to target efficiently and clearly which are the pre-existing pre -existing susceptible, susceptible or who are not infants is clearly very difficult. We only know the final result of this uh, association. And the final result, uh, already shown by Professor Baraldi, is that uh, uh, more or less fourfold higher risk of wheezing uh, is there in babies with early RSV inception. These data comes from uh, a very productive number of studies, we made a systematic review a few years ago, and we went down to some 22 studies, clustering the years of follow-up up to 30 years of age, and all of them consistently showing that there was an association between early RSV and wheezing in early stages of life, or asthma after adolescence or in early adulthood. I will now go through some of these studies just to show you uh, in possibly in a repetitive way that uh, the association is always there. Whichever the age you are able to study and to track these infants or these uh, young adolescents or adults. It's, uh, as, f as a neonatologist and as a pediatrician, uh, it's a, a it's a matter of uh, daily routine practice uh, to see that early RSV causes wheezing and recurrent wheezing in uh, young infants, uh, at least in the first uh, three, four years of life. And this court study from the UK shows the data in the first five years of age, concluding that there is a threefold higher risk. But not only risk of uh, wheezing, as we, uh, when we consider respiratory sequelae, we need to include also all these items, all those items that are characteristics of an increased use of medical resources due to respiratory disorders. 
In this view, when uh, the babies uh, have achieved the age of uh, six years, it has been shown by cohort studies that the use of bronchodilators, the use of leukotriene antagonists, the use of steroids, the use of antibiotics has been always increasing in, uh, in those infants with early RSV. So this is clearly, and this is an additional demonstration, an healthcare issue. It's not only a respiratory niche issue, but it's an healthcare issue because uh, RSV probably opens the way to a number of uh, cascade consequences in the domain of the respiratory function and morbidity. Let's move on. Um, we are now at six years of age, and this is another very nice study showing that the forced respiratory volume at one minute is decreased by almost 7%. You know very well, uh, being pediatricians, that uh, these kinds of uh, uh, tests cannot be performed efficiently uh, prior to five or even six years of age. So this is uh, probably the first uh, possible demonstration of a, of a um, consequence, of an outcome on a respiratory function in young babies as soon as this outcome can be identified and measured. So we, summarizing up to now, we, are seeing, we have seen three different outcomes. One of them is recurrent wheezing. The second one is enhanced and increased use of medication for respiratory disorders. And the third one is a demonstration of a functional alteration of the respiratory tract. These observations repeat consistently over the years, and I will go through very quickly once I, I was able to uh, flag these points. This is a study considering seven years old babies. This is a study considering eight years old babies in UK. This is another one considering a young adolescent up to 18 years of age is the Seegers cohort. Again, four, five, six-fold higher risk of uh, um, obstructive disorders. This is uh, for young adults, and we have also data up to 30 years of age. Of course, the value and the weight, the relative weight of confounding factors is becoming increasingly difficult to ascertain, but it's nonetheless worthwhile to show you that when you are able enough to track a population over the lifespan, it's very, very likely that at the end of the day you can show and report decreased respiratory function or increased respiratory morbidity in subjects who had early RSV. And then, how can we think about prevention? Uh, Professor Baraldi was alluding in these uh, last slides was alluding to newer medications, not only able to prevent RSV bronchiolitis, but possibly able also to prevent long-lasting respiratory outcomes. We have some scattered data from a cohort study showing, as you see here, an increase uh, frequency of uh, wheezing and hyper-responsiveness at school age in babies, uh, in former babies, uh, having been uh, affected by RSV once they had already nine years of age. But we have basically two big cohorts, uh, one from Japan and the other from USA, where at age three here and at age six in Japan, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve of survival being free without uh, wheezing or asthma is uh, clearly in favor of those uh, patients uh, who did not meet with RSV. And this is the Japanese study. 
you note uh, published in the Blue Journal. For those of you who are messing with the pulmonology, the Blue Journal is uh, the Bible. So when you see data of this kind in such a journal, uh, this means uh, that this is uh, really impacting the healthcare system. But we need to go further and we need to take a look at two data generated by randomized clinical trials, by prospective data, and we, as of today, have only two. The Blanken study in Utrecht in 2013 and the O'Brien study in the USA, one with palivizumab and the other with motavizumab. So you already saw from uh, Eugenio Baraldi last slide that uh, the Blanken study was positive, but I want to spend uh, one word about uh, the O'Brien study with motavizumab. Motavizumab was meant to become the new generation palivizumab, more potent, uh, a little longer acting, well, it did fail uh, with uh, a number of reasons that I want to go further and explain, but one of the reasons for failure was also that it was not able to prevent wheezing or asthma in the first three years of age in babies undergoing this treatment. In turn, palivizumab does. Palivizumab does prevent, and in the first year, the MACI trial by Blanken and colleagues showed a 61% reduction of the total number of wheezing days in babies exposed to palivizumab versus placebo. And we are talking here about the late and moderately late preterm infants. But the true core of the study was the follow-up, the follow-up up to six years of age, and this is the only existing one study with a prospective follow-up of uh, patients uh, randomized to palivizumab or placebo. Well, based on this follow-up uh, and based on the data published uh, four years ago, we, need, we continue to see a decrease, a significant decrease in current asthma at six years of age with an absolute risk reduction of 10% and a relative risk reduction of 41%. So you remember it was a 61 in the first year of life. It's still up to 41 after six years of age. But curiously, but probably not that curiously, lung function it's not significantly different. There's only a little slight trend towards having better FEV1 measures in babies exposed to palivizumab compared with the others. So how to interpret, and I go straight to the end, these data. Uh, once more, I underline that these are the only data generated from cohorts followed up based on a randomized clinical trial and based on a prospective design. So we need to rely very carefully to these data. The point that within day and the point of that of asthma continues to be decreased stands for an ability of palivizumab to prevent something that RSV unchains probably hyper-responsiveness. Because if we have a normal FIV1 when you perform an hyper-responsiveness test, it might even and always be that the insult uh, provided by the test is not that enough to provoke a wheezing or an obstructive response. So we are in the middle of an explanation, but we are not yet there. Nonetheless, all uh, pulmonology and more broadly the WHO uh, entities recommend as a strategy for prevention of asthma the accurate and continued uh, quest towards medication that prevent RSV and rhinovirus. As just as Professor Baraldi showed, RSV and rhinovirus prophylaxis is, has been endorsed for years and years by the Asthma Society, by the NHA, NHA, and resources 
need to be dedicated to this because uh, by preventing RSV, we might come to a prevention of uh, asthma, something that would be terribly impactful. We now have only near Sevimab adding to palivizumab, but the future is bright, like uh, it was uh, said earlier on, and possibly is bright because uh, the new monoclonals, uh, Nersevimab and uh, probably in a couple of years also Klesrovimab, but promise to be longer acting and therefore to be eligible for all uh, birth cohorts of infants, not only for uh, a niche category of high-risk infants. These data on this seven have been shown up again, but I want to show you the 70-80% ability to reduce RSV bronchiolitis needing hospitalization or medical attention. The next steps for these studies are to track these infants over the years and check whether they are, uh, are positively driven also in terms of uh, asthma and wheezing, something that I expect too, but needs to be demonstrated. I'm coming to the take-home messages, uh, underlining once more that uh, wheezing and probably asthma are long-lasting consequences of bronchiolitis in the first months of life, underlining that the specific prevention with palivizumab is able to protect to some extent from a wheezing and possibly asthma at least the up to six years of age, we expect similar findings to be shown and to be delivered also by the new monoclonals like nersevimab and clesrovimab or possibly by maternal vaccination. But again, before having these uh, uh, hypotheses becoming an assumption, we need larger further observational and prospective studies that track infants in a prospective randomized design once they are exposed to these new monoclonals and confirm or discard the point that by preventing RSV, we can reduce the burden of asthma-related morbidity in all life long. Thank you very much for your attention.